They need one person. That's really all it takes. And we can do that. Each and every single one of us can just grab one of these young people and change their lives forever. Instead of the pathway going over here to the left, we can help them go over here to the right by just a few words. That's all it takes. It's not this big, you know, elaborate thing. Welcome to the Construction Disruption Podcast, where we uncover the future of building and remodeling. I'm Todd Miller of Isaiah Industries, manufacturer of specialty metal roofing and other building materials. And today, my co-host is Seth Eckerman. How are you doing, Seth? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And I, you know, we just said our challenge words for this episode, so I'm looking forward to that. So our audience knows what's going on. Um, Both Seth and I, plus our guest this episode, have a word that we have been challenged to work into the conversation somehow. So I will challenge the audience to see if you can pick up on what our challenge words might be. And uh, then at the end, uh, we will say whether we've been successful or not. So that'll be fun. So, Seth, I have a couple questions for you. Okay. What does a lemon say when it answers the phone? I do not know. Yellow. 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 There you go. Okay. Here's another one. What kind of car does an egg drive? Drawing a blank. These are getting easier, so you may get the third one. What kind of car does an egg drive? A Yolkswagen. Yolkswagen. Okay. Last one. So this is the easiest one. I think you got the best best chance on this one. I'm believing in you on this one. Okay, man. What does a bee use to brush its hair? A honeycomb. Ah, there you there go. go. I knew he did it. You know, something that happened to me recently, I don't. I think I forgot to tell you. Did you hear about my peekaboo accident? I did not. That sounds rather ominous, though. It was. Yeah, it was pretty traumatic. It landed me in the ICU. The peekaboo in the ICU. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe we should get on with the show. What do you Probably. think? Probably. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay. So today's guest is Letitia Hankey. Letitia is president and CEO of ARS Roofing and Gutters based in Santa Rosa, California. Standing for Alternative Roofing Solutions, Letitia started ARS in 2004, building it into a large and highly successful contracting company. Uh, Letitia, I think, has a fascinating history. Uh, that I look forward to hearing her share. But one of the things she is known for is her philanthropy and giving generously to her community. Um, In fact, I threw the question up on some social media, LinkedIn, I think, and just asked for anyone in the construction space who is a business owner who is known for giving back to their community. Letitia's name actually came up immediately from not one, but two people. Uh, So that was awesome. Over the years, Letitia has received numerous awards and recognition. Uh, She received the 2014 Small Business of the Year Award from California Governor Gavin Newsom. She was winner of the 2017 Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the National 100 Black Women Council. She received the 2018 Walmart Community Playmaker Award from the Golden State Warriors. She's been featured on uh, the Kelly Clarkson Show and also Mike Rose Returning the Favor Show. Roofing Contractor recognized her as the 2020 Residential Roofer of the Year. And she was also more recently, most recently, been named the 2022 Influential Women of the Year, uh, recognized by the North Bay Business Journal. And that honestly is just a few of her accomplishments. Letitia, thank you so much for joining us today on Construction Disruption. I'm really looking forward to digging into your story of inspiration and encouragement. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, let's, I, I'm looking forward to learning. So you grew up in a small town or in small town, Northern California. I kind of gather you grew up near the shores of Clear Lake and also Mount Kanakdai. I knew a gentleman once who wanted to build a tram ride up the side of Mount Kanakdai. Oh, yeah. so I often heard how beautiful it was there. Tell us a little bit about your your early years growing up, though. Yeah, I grew up in the country. I was born in the Bay Area, 
of California, uh, like near Berkeley. Sometimes people are familiar with Berkeley. Sure. But my parents, uh, my grandfather had given my dad some property up in good old Lake County, up in the country with deer and rabbits. And <laughs> so, you know, it was very exciting for my parents because they were going to have a chance to, you know, become homeowners and, you know, just kind of have a different life for me and my brother. But it was also a little rough as well because in Lake County is not very known for diversity. So, you know, there weren't very many, you know, black people in general, but in my school, you know, it's a very, very small town school, maybe about 800 kids in a K through 12 school. And uh, there were like six black kids in the whole school. So I was bullied, you know, severely bullied for oh. um, many years. So, you know, I got through it. I learned so much from the experience and I feel like what I went through as a kid really is why why I do what I do today. You know, it gives me a chance to give back to others and help other young people through all the adversities that they face. And so, you know, I wouldn't give that up, that experience up, because I, I feel like it really kind of gave me that drive that I have today. So um, I'm grateful for my parents wanting to build a better life for me and my brother. And it is a very beautiful place to grow up in, though. Yeah, I remember one weekend I was out in California and I, I was out on business and I was uh, stayed out there over the weekend. And so I was just driving around Northern California. And I have to admit, I got into a few places like, oh, this is a little strange. <laughs> there are. There are. It, was, it was a little scary at times. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, so you then went on to college with the intention of being in the music industry and um, even looked like you'd probably end up being a professional singer and musician, but things took a turn for you in college as you kind of fell into the roofing industry and in a career that you really came to love. Tell us a little bit about how that happened. Yeah, so music has been a huge part of my life. You know, part of the getting through all the bullying that I went through, one of my teachers who was a music teacher in school, she put a trumpet in my hands when I was seven years old. And Every day at lunch, she would teach me how to play the trumpet so that way I wouldn't get bullied on the playground. So no. I fell in love with music. I fell in love with how music made me feel. And as I kept growing up, I'm just like, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to be this big rock star and go off doing that. But I was broke in college because it was not paying the bills, gigging and trying to be a musician. And I was putting myself through college and, uh, realized that, that it wasn't happening. So I, in my junior year, I started working for a roofing company as the receptionist and really just wanting to meet. In that moment, it was just, I needed a job. It was all, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to have a roofing career. It was about a job. And I started working there. I was 19, almost 20 years old when I started working there. And then what ended up happening just over the years you know, my my boss, you know, let go our office manager and he promoted me to the office manager. That was a year into it. And then I became the manager of the company about three years later. And then I'm starting to manage the company. Then my boss realized he wanted to retire. And he com he comes to me and says, hey, I want you to buy my roofing company. I said, I'm not a roofer. Like, what do you what do you mean? <laughs> buy your roofing company. Yeah. Did I know how to run a roofing company? Yes but I was not a roofer. He said, are you willing to learn? Now I'm like 20 something years old at that point. I was maybe 22, 23. I'm just like, sure, why not? And so for another few years, I learned how to roof. And once I, once I knew how to roof, there was really nothing stopping me at that point to go and get my own contractor's license. And that's what I did. Um, in 2003, I went to get my license. I passed the test. And then I started my own company instead in 2004. He went ahead and just retired. And then I bought the assets of his company and started my own company in 2004. I hired a, about 11 of his employees at the time and then just built my company up from there. So, yeah, that's how it happened. That's the shorter version, of course, but that's really what happened. I ended up dropping out of college in my senior year because I, I had this I got this big promotion, you know, with the roofing company when I went from receptionist up to, you know, the office manager and the manager of the company. I just realized, you know. I had this great opportunity to, you know, run this business. And I've always been very business or and I've always been an entrepreneur since I was a little girl. Actually, I used to 
braid hair and make hammer pants. You guys remember hammer pants? Uh, well, I do. I don't know that Seth I does. Know, you know. <laughs> I don't know how old you guys are. I'm just saying. And I was making those after school, you know, selling them for 10 bucks and, you know, making my money. And I knew that I wanted to do something, you know, in business. I wasn't sure exactly what. And, um, you know, college was great for me, but I just, I went because my family in school told me, go to college, go to college as soon as you graduate. So that's just what I did. But I found a great career in the construction trades. That is an incredible story. It really is. And back to music for just a moment. Didn't realize you started on trumpet. That was my instrument. So, uh, yeah, so we got that in common. That's awesome. I got to tell you, too, so. Um, last night, my wife and I went to a concert by a 11 member acapella singing group called Voctive. And, uh, so it's like octave with a V you need to check these people I'm out. Really it, ran them down. It was absolutely incredible. It was a, it was a neat concert, neat people. Um, but just beautiful, beautiful music. So that was cool. I'm very interested in music. You know, tr- I stopped playing I stopped playing the trumpet when I was about uh, 12 because I, again, I got bullied for, you know, like I have big lips and I used to put the trumpet up to my lips and they make fun of me. So I took a piano and drums instead. <laughs> <laughs> and and I still drum today. On, I drum at my church. I have a, um, oh, cool. a band that I play with. So, yeah, music is definitely a big love of mine. <laughs> oh, cool. Seth leads the uh, contemporary worship band at his church, actually. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is, that's awesome. Though, yeah, I haven't played trumpet in 30 some yeah. years. I, I tried to pick it up. My chops are completely gone. So, you know, it doesn't work. Way it works. <laughs> yep, yep. So, you started um, your own company based upon the knowledge that you'd obtained from the industry. Um, curious as you started out with ARS riffing and gutters, any any surprises still early on as you were started this business and and entered the the world of it? Yeah, it was it was an interesting process because you know as a female in roofing there just weren't any. <laughs> I didn't have any sure. mentors that were in the industry that could just kind of guide me through what I would deal with, and for me. When I started my company, I kind of went through, it's funny because I really did go through kind of that bullying all over again. I, I'll never forget the very first incident. I, you know, I was always trying to kind of blend in as a roofer. So I'd always, you know, wear my jeans and polo shirts and, you know, and just kind of blend in with the guys, I guess I would say. And I went to this networking function with a bunch of contractors and they were hanging out by the bar and I kind of walked up to get something and one of the contractors saw me in my logo and he says, oh, you're with ARS Roofing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm actually the CEO. And he says, oh, from the kitchen to the rooftop, huh? Oh, oh my goodness yeah. gracious. Yeah, yeah, no. uh, yeah you kind of gasp when you hear that. And I goodness. remember that experience. Now, back then, I'm just like, ha, ha, ha. you know, I just kind of laughed. Yeah, yeah. Well, would Again, you remember that? I'm just blending in. That's the kind of experience that I was having when I first got into there because, you know, they just didn't know who, they're like, who is this person? Like, who is this lady trying to take over the roofing industry? And, you know, and then that's the sexism side, but racism, you know, I had customers that wouldn't shake my hand. They wouldn't open their doors, you know, even though they knew I was coming to present their bids. And it's one of those things where now, after all the experiences that I had in that way, I was hiding a lot. I wasn't putting my name on anything. I used to sign my name L.R. Hanky, So they think I'm a man when they would see it at and then I had one experience that really brought me out of my shell. And I had a chance to like put my face on everything, like all of my marketing and everything you see now that I have. My face, my name, my full name, Letitia Hanky is on everything. Awesome. And that really changed my life forever because once I kind of came out from that, I was able to really just explode my business because I wasn't in hiding anymore. So that was the one thing that surprised me was just that, you know, I didn't, I wasn't welcomed with open arms. I guess I would say it was um, it was just an interesting experience. But now I get to do business with people that want to do business with me and they want to support me. And wow. now it's just been really great. Well, you've been through a lot. I'm thrilled with where you've ended up, though. And that's uh, that's fantastic. So today, ARS, you know, really is quite sizable. Kind of curious, tell us what areas you cover, what types of projects, materials you work with, kind of a little bit about the the scope of your business today. 
great. So we have 24 employees right now. We are in northern, so I'm, I'm the North Bay, so I'm mainly Sonoma County, Marin County, Napa County, um, San Francisco area, some of the Bay Area for larger commercial projects. I do specialize in commercial and, and like condo associations, and we only do pretty much residential for referrals. <laughs> so previous clients, so okay. I'm not that competitive in the market when it comes to residential. So it's just all of our referrals is most, most of the business that we get is by referral. I don't do that much marketing besides, you know, radio interviews and webinars and things like that, which is always great. I love what I do. I love my team. I have such a, a great team. They're my family and um, I wouldn't be where I am today without them. So uh, just uh, product wise, I specialize in a lot of products that are, I really only do products that I know that are going to last that are going to be around. And, you know, I don't really get myself into a lot of new products until they've been on the market a long, long time. So I do a lot of composition shingle. We do single ply for a lot of our flat roof and low slope roofing. And then winter season, which in California, we don't get that much rain. But when the winter season, we stick to a lot of the maintenance work. That's what gets us through the winter. You know, all my crews work all year round. So we do a lot of gutter cleaning, roof maintenance, keeping leaves and debris off the roof screening for people, especially here where we are in California, we've had a lot of fire, huge fires. So people are really adamant about making sure they get gutter screens and keeping all their roofs clean of debris and such. So we're year round and it's just always a blessing to know that my crews are always going to be working. Wow. Very good. Yeah, that's, um, that's quite sizable. And I love the way you kind of do that diversification between the different seasons as far oh, yeah. as the type of work you focus on. So kind of back to what, you know, brought your name to me in the first place with your philanthropic side, seems like uh, much of what you do and, and how you lead your business and, and what you do in your community is based on wanting to change the world to make the world a better place. Tell us a little bit about how that, I mean, you've told us a lot about your background and I suspect a lot of that passion kind of sprang forth from that, but I uh, would love to hear a little bit more about that. Oh, uh, yeah. So I started the Lyme Foundation, which is my nonprofit. And it does stem from what I said earlier about being bullied, because I remember I'll never actually forget the feeling that I had from my my teacher, like coming over to me. I was actually hiding behind an oak tree trying to eat my lunch because kids would always steal my lunch. And, and that feeling that I got when she came to my rescue. And that's how I always feel. And I started Lion Foundation for that purpose is so that way we, we can come to the rescue of all of these young people that are dealing with, you know, suicidal thoughts, hating themselves, just not feeling like they have a place in this world. And we do that by giving them a great opportunity to see the potential in themselves through different programs. And my son, his name is Amil, is E-M-I-L, and Lyme is Amil spelled backwards. Okay. I'm nice. <laughs> People are like, is that Lyme disease? No, it's not about Lyme disease. <laughs> Why? It's not like lemons and limes. My son, when he was seven years old, it was the first time he was called the N-word. My son is multiracial. And um, although I was called N-word regularly and, and when I was younger, my son came home and said, you know, mom, why do, why do people hate me? And uh, whew, it was a yeah. moment for me. This The first time I got to tell him my story and what I went through as a kid and I talked to him about bullying and standing up for himself. And when I went to start my nonprofit, I, I just really wanted it to be something dear to my heart. And what's more dear than, you know, your, your own kiddo, right? So that's why it's called Lime Foundation. And uh, one of our programs uh, stems around construction trades and kind of the story I told you about, you know, dropping out of college because we know that a lot of young people go to college because they just think that's the right thing to do. That's what they've been told all their lives. But it's not really what they want to do. They want to work with their hands or actually have a career or get a job right out of school. And we recognize that. And so we go into high schools and different programs, like foster programs, like for foster youth or probation youth. And we help those youth that want to have a, an amazing career in the trades. And we teach them and we educate them on how they can have that career. And then we get them great jobs in that career. And that's one of our main focuses of our Lyme Foundation is our Next Gen Trades Academy. Wow, I certainly applaud you on that. That sounds incredible. And, and you know, not only making a, a difference in their lives, but making a difference in our in our industry as well. Um, 
you know, by obviously the labor shortage uh, is major thing in construction and certainly looking for more diversity as well within our industry. So uh, all in oh. all, there's win-win on all sides. There. Yeah. And just thank you for yeah leveraging your story and using it just to then go out and be loving on more people rather than all sorts of other emotions that could rise up out of that. But yep. Todd touched on it, this crossover of those passions of your business and these, you know, uh, philanthropic efforts. Would love to hear more about how then you've integrated your business and your foundation and what that crossover looks like and, you know, opportunities that you have for your team to serve too. I don't, I don't know if you all get together and take kids out mushroom hunting or something on the weekends or what, you know, what that might look like, but what's that integration look like? Good question, Seth. What I love most about my roofing company is that, you know, number one, we do hire the students. So, you know, when we have graduates through our program, I nab them up as quickly as I can. Awesome. Whoever says they want to be a roofer, I'm just like, okay, you're hired. You know, like I don't even know you when you're hired. Um, you know, what I love the most about the program is that we actually bring in um, different CEOs of local businesses. We bring in roofers and architects. It's great because some of our architects, they help design um, different, you know, projects for our students to be able to build when we're doing it on site. I, you know, we built a birdhouse. I, I'm going to have them do, a, you know, a design of a wagon the next time so we can build something a little more, you know, extravagant there. But that part's really great because they're able to like have these kids do some hands-on experience, which is really important. And then in our program, we do a lot of education. We really just introduce them to the trades to get them excited about going into painting, get them excited about being a roofer. And then we help them get that job. So the way I integrate my business with it is that I, I'm one of the mentors, of course, under roofing. Of course, I started the program, but <laughs> I always come to every class and um, make sure that I'm, I'm in the classes myself. So that way they can see that I'm, you know, really invested in, in their time and getting them their careers. And then just making sure that we're mentoring them and getting them, you know, hired and with really good companies. We do a big betting process through it all. So I'm, I'm grateful that my roofing company is always, you know, involved as much as possible. And we donate like every job that we do, every single job, whether it's a little skylight repair or a giant commercial hotel re-roof that we do, we donate up to 5% of, of our net profit at the end of every job to the Lion Foundation so that we, we can keep this program going forever. I, I really want this program to be, you know, going forever. So that's really how I integrate my company. Mm, awesome. You know, I love your vision for the Lyme Foundation. And I mean, not just vision, but reality of what you're doing. I mean, it's almost almost like you're running a, a trade school, a technical school, but yet, you know, it's it's done in a much more private sort of way. And, and I love that. One of our past episodes, we had the uh, person from our, actually our local tech school on, and it was amazing to hear about how they build into youth and get them connected with uh, employers and all that. And yet you're doing this as a, as a private thing. And that's really cool. I'm kind of curious. So when you look at others in your company, do they share your passion and, and care and interest in, you know, giving back and building into others? Do, do they share that for you? I mean, what, what does that look like? Yeah, my, my team... On the roofing side, you know, my team knew right away what I was doing. I mean, I, I talked to them first because I needed a buy-in from everybody, from my field workers, all the way from my office workers. I needed everyone to know that this is my passion and, you know, I'm going to be out the office a little bit more and I need to make sure you guys can handle it, which they are just miracle workers. workers. And everyone said, yeah. And then I explained to them the story. It was important for them to understand why I was so passionate about this. And yeah, we have a complete buy-in from everybody. I have very passionate, my team is very passionate and they truly care. You know, I feel like that's one of the things that makes us different in the roofing industry as well, because every single one of my team members, you know, they kind of put themselves in the, in the place of the client. You know, I would want my house to be nice and clean with no nails, you know, on the driveway. And, you know, so they really take extra care of people. And, um, and we talk about it, you know, we, we talk about, you know, helping young people, they train these people. I've hired five um, Next Gen Trades Academy um, graduates, two are still with me right now. And they've been trained and learning and they learn from 
my staff. That's how they're learning how to be in this industry and have these great careers at such a young age and making great money. <laughs> they make really good money at, you know, really young ages. So I could have done it without the buy-in from my staff and and their passion and, um, and their love for what I do. So um, they're very supportive. Any particular stories come in mind of uh, individuals and, you know, lives you've impacted through your foundation or maybe folks that then came into your business? And, you know, we don't need to give names, but, you know, just any, any real stories that come to mind of, hey, we really impacted this person. Oh, man. Okay. I'm glad I'm not going to be on camera for this one. Let me tell you. Uh, 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 <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I can't even get it out. Um, just recently, actually, I hear about what my students are going through all the time. They do talk to us about their situations. We know when they come in, you know, what's going on. But just recently in the last month, I found out that one of our graduates who uh, grew up homeless with his mom and his sister, and they were living in a car. And um, when he was growing up, she, his mom had to send him away to a, a, a boy's school so he could have something stable. And when he graduated, they were living in the car and he saw our Trades Academy program and he signed up for it, got, came in, graduated pretty much at the top of our class. And we got him this really, really great job at this company. It's, it's called, the company's called Bay Alarm. They're a great alarm company. They, they move a lot of our graduates up, you know, up into, um, you know, better positions. And He's in this great position making a large amount of money. He was able to move his mom and his sister out of the car into an apartment. And he and his girlfriend just had a baby. And I'll never forget him telling that story in front of about almost 300 people at our, uh, we had our fundraising gala. And it was the first time that he had ever like read and told his story to a bunch of strangers. And it was the first time that I had learned it. So, and he directly related our program to his success and the success of moving his family out of a car. And that's just one story of so many, <laughs> so many that we get to hear and know. And that's the whole purpose of this program for me, you know, is knowing that I know these young people are going through so much and all they really need is just, you know, one person to tell them that they're capable of so much more in life. And when I hear those kind of stories, I know that I'm doing the right thing and I'm going to keep doing it. That is an incredible story. And I want to I want to be on your list next time you've got a fundraiser or gala or something going on. I want to know about it. So uh, it incredible, <laughs> incredible. So, you know, I mean, a lot of our audience members out there are, are other business owners. I, I think really you just summed it up extremely well. But, you know, why would you? encourage them to be involved in giving back in some fashion. And, you know, it, it may not have to look exactly like what you're doing, but something that they're passionate about that they rally behind. Why would you really encourage them to do that? I told the story of my dad. I was at an event recently, a roofing convention, and I told the story of my father, how he, at, at a young age, he dropped out of high school in the ninth grade was getting in all kind of trouble and drugs. He's been clean now 50 years. And he just needed an opportunity. And he had a mentor. He had someone that came up. It was his pastor. And his pa when my father turned 18, his pastor said, you, you need to do something with your life. You are capable of more than you know. And my dad was great with his hands. And he was just great with, with that type of thing. And he joined a union and became a pipe fitter when he was 19 years old and he built this great life. And that's how he was able to build his own home, move us up to a great area because he had a mentor. Mentoring is the reason and the thing that I would say to people, we have a chance to talk to young people about the things that we've been through, the opportunities that are available to them, but they just need someone. They need one person. It, it, that's really all it takes. And we can do that. Each, each and every single one of us can just grab one of these young people and change their lives forever. Instead of the pathway going over here to the left, we can help them go over here to the right by just a few words. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. It's not this big, you know, elaborate thing. And so that's what I would encourage people to just really consider 
is just being a mentor and taking out that time. Wherever you are in you know, the United States, there are high schools and places, foster care places. There are probation areas. There's p- people that need you and you have a, a chance to change a life absolutely forever, just like mine was. Wow. That is powerful stuff. And yeah, I, and you know, you see that so often in effective leaders and I applaud you on what you're doing, but you know, you, you hit a point in leadership and you realize part of this mantle I have upon myself is to build into others and, and to uh, use, you know, my influence or my connections or whatever I can, but really just boils down to loving others, I guess, when it gets yes. right to it really does. Wow. Well, kind of, okay, so so let's look back at, at really the business side of roofing and so forth. Here on the show, we talk a lot about the future of our industry. I'm curious if anything comes to mind to you when you look out into the future of construction, maybe roofing, um, maybe solar. I know you get involved cleaning solar panels and such. Um, anything that really excites you about our industry coming up in the future? I think the one thing that's exciting me right now is just noticing how contractors are ready to finally train young people because we have this huge gap. And I don't know if it exists in every single trade, but I know in roofing, I, you know, I have like the ones that are, you know, between 40 and 60. And then I have, you know, under 30 and there's no one in that middle you know, that middle gap for when my 40 to 60 are about to retire. And what I'm noticing more and more when I t- especially talk to roofers is that they're finally getting that mentality that, you know, we're ready to start training these young people to f- start filling in those gaps, getting that covered. And that's important if you're going to have this, you know, robots aren't going to be doing our roofing. Come on. You know, I know there's robots out there trying to do stuff, but they're not going to be doing roofing, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to be people. And we need to have people there. And that is the one thing that's been really exciting me lately is especially going to a couple of roofing conventions. They're all just like, okay, we're ready. You know, we're ready to do this. Let's do this. Let's start training these young people. And that's really great because it took a long, long time for me to, you know, be able to hear that. They're like, oh, we don't want to train anyone who's green. It just takes too long. It costs too much money. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. It does. But now look where we are. <laughs> look at us now. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that makes me truly happy to see that, you know, they're ready now. <laughs> so let's do it. <laughs> yep. I hear you. So as a company that was quick to adopt that and be on the leading edge, you know, kind of ahead of the rest of the industry, what are some things you've learned along the way of the best way to incorporate these younger folks into our industry and organizations, best ways to train, maybe how we need to train and lead differently? Uh, what are some of those lessons? The lessons have been that they learned the way I learned. There was no roofing school that I went to. There was no, you know, roofing apprentice type school. They learned on the job. And so having an internal training program uh, step by step for these people, they'll pick up on it. If you just, you know, let them do it on the job, let them actually do the work and be there on site. And that's why I mean, they're thrown in there. So it's not like, I mean, we teach them ladder safety and everything, but (laughs) we don't say, hey, just get up on the roof. But that's been the greatest thing that I've learned is just that, you know, it's not about going to some school and learning how to roof. It's really about being there, seeing it and doing, doing it with your own hands. And because we have a program for them for training, that's been the best thing that I've seen so far for my roofers. I had a a roofer, one of my graduates who worked for me for about two, two and a half years. He trained with us, got really good. And he came to me, he says, you know, my dream is I, I want to work for Tesla. That's my dream. I've always wanted to work for Tesla. I love Tesla. I said, okay, if that's your dream, let's make it happen. And he's currently doing, installing Tesla solar roofs right now. He's running his own crew. He's been there now for two years. And, you know, I'm proud to have been that stepping stone for him. You know, we threw him in there, we got him trained, and now he's doing some higher level things. So that's what I would say is just, you know, get them in that training, throw them in, be willing to take that extra time to just train them because they'll learn it just like we did. You know, it took us a long time or, you know, to get, grasp it. We have to give them that same courtesy, okay. you know, and that's how I truly feel. You know, when you mention that sort of generation age gap, that's kind of that middle place. And yeah, that's pretty universal in our industry. And I, Uh we've 
we've talked about it before. And, you know, I, I think that every generation has always complained about the younger generation. And in particular, it seems like, you know, we've seen a lot with boomers complaining about millennials and stuff. But, you know, one of the things that came up, I was talking to someone there today, I said, you know, the problem isn't with the younger generation. The problem is the older generation hasn't been building into them. And that's the problem. That and, really is the problem. You know, they, everything, things change. So we still have to, we have to be adaptable to that. You know, the, the millennials are different from baby boomers. That's just, it is what it is. You know, I mean, we just have to realize that we have to be adaptable as well. And we have to kind of adapt to the changing of the times and who we're training and just be, be willing to adapt to that. And if you are, you're going to be very successful in getting these, you know, younger people into your, your companies. And they are extravagant. I'm telling you right now, we've been training young people that are, you know, 19 to 22. They are just, you know, really into it and excited. I remember one of my latest hirees from my graduate program. He says, I sat down with him his first 30 days and I had his evaluation. I'm like, you know, how are things going? And he says, oh, I love tearing off. <laughs> wow. Like, who says that? <laughs> Do you know any roofers right now that would tell you that they love tearing off? Like, he's like, oh, that's my favorite thing. So now all the crews want him on their crew because <laughs> he's like excited about tearing off. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, so, you know, we just we love that. You know, that's that's an exciting thing for me, of course, because I'm just like, oh, great. Let's get a few more of those, you know. But it's just been nice to just see these young people excited. They want to work with their hands. We're working with a very different generation now that, you know, they're like, I don't have to go to college. I could be making $25 an hour right out of high school, which they're doing, by the way. <laughs> These right. contractors are, because there's such a huge competition. I was just talking to one of my graduates who's been working for a company and he's like, I really, really, really want to go into electrical. And now he's got several electricians offering him sign up bonuses to work for them or you know, this rate of pay and then he's negotiating. And what about my benefits? And now he's he's going to be starting with the company at like $24 an hour with a $1,000 sign-on bonus and like benefits. Just, you know, that's exciting for young people to know that they can step right into that right out of high school. So it makes me excited, if you can't tell. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that is great stuff. Like, great stuff. Well, so so you're going through all this career and all, all the rigmarole of the roofing industry and everything. I, I have to ask, though, is music still a part of your life? You mentioned playing drums in your church. Is that right? Yes, it is a hundred percent part of my life. Um, awesome. I have a concert coming up this coming Sunday, a Christmas concert with my church. We're putting on a big outdoor concert and oh, you know, no. I'm the drummer. So I um, I love it. I just uh, was in a battle of the bands back in August. My band won the battle of the bands. That was very exciting as well. And right. <laughs> so, yeah, I <laughs> I love I love music. It's, it's really my chance, you know, with everything that I do work wise, because running a nonprofit is a business as well. So, you know, it's just insane. Oh, yeah. Music is my chance. It's, it's my self-care it is being able to you know, write music and, you know, play my drums. So, yeah, I still do it. Very cool. Very neat. Well, good for you. I'm glad to hear that. Well, we're close to wrapping up the business end of things. And your enthusiasm is just so infectious. I love it. Is there anything we haven't covered today that you would like to share with our audience? I just would love the audience to just you know, check out our line foundation. And so you can just kind of see the things that we're doing in our community. And if you've always wanted to have a chance to start your own nonprofit or just do something for your community, I am a wide open book. I would love to talk to anyone to, to tell them how they can do it and, you know, follow your dreams. You know, a lot of people have these ideas and they just kind of, you know, sit around on a shelf and whatever. That's how my idea was. You know, I had a long time idea of this and finally had a chance to just kind of bring it to life. And it's been um, not only life changing for me, but of course for others. So I just encourage you to reach out to me and I would love to just kind of tell you how you could do it too. And that's, that's really about it for me. Fantastic. Well, we're going to give you a chance in a moment here to uh, say how folks can reach out to you. And uh, we'll also have that in the show notes, but 
Um, before we close out, I have to ask you if you'd like to participate in something we call our rapid fire questions. So these are seven questions. They may be silly, may be serious. Just give a quick answer. Our audience needs to understand if Letitia agrees to this. She has no idea what we're going to ask. So uh, are you up to the challenge of rapid fire? <laughs> yes, I'm going to do it. Yep. Awesome. You know, I'm ready. It's pretty painless, I promise. Sure. <laughs> We will alternate asking questions. Seth, would okay. you like to lead off? Sure. Rapid fire question number one. What is your bucket list vacation? Tahiti. I want to be one of those little huts on top of the water. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. That, that would be cool. We actually had an opportunity where we were bidding roofing for the Shangri-La Resort that was kind of like those that you're envisioning. <laughs> And I don't know what's happened to that. It came up during COVID and then got delayed by COVID. And I thought it'd be awesome. Okay. Question number two. What is your favorite meal? Pizza. Pizza? Love, I'm a cheeseaholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would probably be mine too, actually. There's, there's a particular type of pizza around here or, or restaurant that I really like. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Uh, next question, which I feel like we've talked about uh, this, in, and uh, but hearing you state it succinctly will be great. So what would you most like to be remembered for? My passion. Uh, uh, my passion. Wonderful. Beautiful. Question number four. This is a fun one. This is one of our favorites. If you had to eat a crayon, what color of crayon would you choose to eat? <laughs> it would probably be red because I... For whatever reason, when I think of a red crayon, I think of strawberries. So I think if I imagine that while I'm eating it, it will taste like a strawberry. <laughs> Mind there over matter. Go. Oh, anyway. <laughs> from a kid that ate paste when she was in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, we all did that. when I said that. <laughs> I think we all had our paste eating days, probably. <laughs> it was so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> If you could wave a magic wand and change anything about the roofing or construction industry, what would you change? I would love to have more women in uh, the roofing or construction industry. Absolutely. Amen. Yes, amen. Us too. <laughs> uh, okay, next to last question. What is, I? you got, this, this is, you got a choice. What is either a weird fact that you know or an unusual talent that you have? Oh my goodness. Oh, you're stomping me on this one. Uh, I don't think I know any weird facts and a weird talent. Uh oh. It's okay. <laughs> you guys got me on that one. <laughs> Do I have like 20 minutes to think about that one? Well, if you oh think of it before the end of the show, we'll throw okay. it in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll let Seth do the last yeah, question. This will be an easier one. So, who is one person you would want on your team in the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it would have to be my husband. Oh. Because, we're, <laughs> because we're like zombie. We, we watch all the zombie <laughs> shit. And so we... Lily, when we're watching zombie shows, we're always talking about, well, if, if we were in this situation, we would be doing so. I really think he, and he always has great ideas of like, okay, next time this happens, babe, we're going to make sure we have the rope. And so a hundred percent, my husband, I think he would definitely make, make sure that we survive it. There you go. It sounds like a good team for sure. Yeah, and Todd does not look like it, maybe, but he he is a fellow Walking Dead fan, yeah, so I, you guys I, can I talk have, about that when we wrap I've up. I've watched my episodes of Walking Dead. I have to. Admit. <laughs> and and my wife and I did kind of the same thing. We're like, "Oh, why are they doing that?" <laughs> yes, oh, it drives me insane. I'm like, "Run! Why are you standing there?" <laughs> We're all, and my my husband says, "Honey, honey." Are you yelling at the TV again? I'm like, oops. <laughs> this has been fun. This has been. What a pleasure. I've enjoyed this. So, tell us, for folks who would like to get in touch with you, how can they most easily do that? I would love for you to make contact with me by email. 
Uh, my email address is my first name, Letitia, spelled L-E-T-I-T-I-A, at arsroofing.com. Uh, because once you send me an email, I'm able to kind of throw out some dates so we can chat. And then my website for my nonprofit, I if you go there, there's also contact information, and that's just the Lime foundation.org that is l-i-m-e <laughs> not like live disease um and just you know check it out there's all, all kind of information and student stories and stuff like that on there so you could just kind of see what we're doing awesome well i encourage folks to do that very good so i have to recap our success um on our challenge words that i think we were all successful <laughs> um <laughs> I, I was I was panicking though. I didn't know if I was gonna figure it out. Um Seth, you had the word I had the word mushroom. That one had to be pretty <laughs> obvious. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it had to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone takes kids mushroom honey. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that was so hard to hold in. And Letitia, you had the word wagon. I had wagon. <laughs> you, you worked it as well. I was like, yeah, my architect's going to design a. a wagon. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know well, where else to put it. <laughs> did it. Fine job, fine job. And I had the word rigmarole, which I was, I oh, was. It unique. was smooth. That yes. one was pretty. <laughs> smooth, I have to say, they was. It was natural. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, people didn't guess that one because you really just kind of had that in there. So uh, I, I was worried. I don't know about you were so sad. But I mean, seriously, <laughs> mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this has been a riot. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, know. you so much for what you're doing, yes. uh, not only for our industry, but for the world. Uh, and for yeah. California and for those youth uh, who you touch. And uh, thank you. Thank you sincerely for that. I had that. a great time. Thank you both. God bless you. Thank you. Well, thank you to our audience for tuning into this episode of Construction Disruption, where our special guest has been Letitia Hankey of ARS Roofing and Gutters. Again, her contact information uh, will be below in the show notes. So I encourage you, please watch for future episodes of our podcast. We always have great guests here. Um, don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. Until the next episode, though, just like we talked about today, change the world for someone, make them smile, encourage them. Powerful things, but yet simple things we can do to change the world. In the meanwhile, God bless, take care. This is Isaiah Industries signing off until the next episode of Construction Disruption.